Welcome to Haunted Talks, the official podcast of The Haunted Walk, offering thematic walking tours in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, Ontario. My name is Jim Dean. I am the creative director for the company, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Today's episode is all about paranormal investigations. We have a great interview lined up for you. Before we get to it, just a quick note to let you know that last summer we started a brand new tour in Ottawa called the Time Travel Trail Adventure. It's very different from our ghost tours, which tend to be a little more dark dark and and somber. The Time Travel Trail Adventure is more of a humorous, offbeat, wacky, and interactive journey through time. Now, I definitely recommend this tour if you're a Doctor Who fan or time travel fan, or you just want to have a fun night out. The tours are going to be launching in Kingston and Toronto on June 27th and are already running here in Ottawa. If you're interested, please visit the website timetraveltrail.com. And now for our interview with Sue Miller from Bytown Paranormal. We are joined today by Sue Miller from Bytown Paranormal. She's an investigator and the events coordinator for the organization. Sue, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. One interesting thing about having you as a guest, Sue, of course, is that you were one of the first tour guides for the Haunted Walk back in the very early days before my time. What's your perspective now? I think you're aware that we're celebrating our 20th anniversary season this year. Thinking about the Haunted Walk compared to, to then and now, you know, what are, you, what are your observations? Uh, it's it's really exciting to see how big it's grown because, you know, being one of the, the first tour guides, uh, the business was really small at the time and, and seeing it build to the size it is today and, and how many people are excited about the Haunted Walk. You ask somebody about it now and they know about it and they've been on it and they want to tell you their experiences. So that's very exciting to see uh, the size of the tours as well and how many tour guides are working. Um, that, that's a huge difference because we were three to four tour guides in Ottawa um, and usually our groups were about 10 to 12 people. If we had a, you know, 20, 30, 40 person night, and we, we couldn't take any more than 40 people <laughs> on a tour in a night, then we'd be full. Uh, that was a huge, huge crowd. Uh, the other thing is we used to go through Sandy Hill, so we didn't even go downtown because the, the walk in Ottawa left from the hostel. We would re- weave our way through Sandy Hill, so a mostly residential area, but they were really supportive of us, and they thought it was kind of neat that we would go around. Um, so now just to see them, you know, going up and down Elgin and sort of going around the whole downtown area, uh, it's it's just really, really exciting to see that it's still here. It's doing really well, and people are excited about it. And did you have any favorite parts of being a tour guide? The thing I really liked about the tour guide, uh, being a tour guide, is that uh, we, being at the hostel, I would get a lot of hostelers that would come on the tour. So not only am I getting people from different countries from all over the world coming on the tour, but I'd get to hear their ghost stories. And some people would even have experiences within the hostel. So you'd hear stories about, oh, this happened to me last night, or I've been staying at the hostel for a week and I heard this noise. Um, Or you'd you'd get them all ramped up for when they had to go back and sleep at the hostel. So that was always fun too, to, to sort of, you know, get them excited at the prospect of, of sleeping in a haunted place. But, the, you know, some of the stories people would tell me on the tour, I had one guy, one of my favorite stories uh, he told me was that he lived in a haunted house. He had bought a small house uh, from a lady, uh, the lady who lived there had passed away. She was an elderly lady that lived alone. And he would come home often and his house would smell like cookies. I guess she was an avid baker. And I said, that's a really nice story. That's a nice ghost to have in your house. And he said, yeah, it's really great, but there's never any real cookies. (laughs) So, you know, stuff like that. It was was a lot of fun. And I just have a natural curiosity about people. So I think one of the things that's common across cultures, across religion, elements of paranormal or ghost stories or it's it's kind of neat. It's kind of the great equalizer that someone has some kind of story in their family or in their background, uh, a belief they hold. And it's it's really kind of neat to hear other people's perspective. Having been a haunted walk tour guide and now with Bytown Paranormal, you obviously have a, have a strong interest in the subject. How did that come about for you? 
different things. Uh, I think the main influence on me in my life was my father. He was always interested in science fiction, the paranormal, the unexplained, and and my mother was not interested in it at all. So I would get to watch these shows with him. Even when I was very young, I mean, I remember watching In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy in the 70s. That was a great show. Uh, and I was, you know, being really young and watching that. And when um, my dad passed away, I was quite young. I was 10 years old. And I heard stories about things that happened. And even though I didn't experience them myself, uh, it fascinated me. Um, my dad was very ill before he passed away. And uh, he used to fall asleep in a lazy boy chair that we had in our house. And uh, that was the only way he could be comfortable. So a lot of the times he would move from the bed in the middle of the night and get into this lazy boy chair. It was the old 70s model. So they made a whole bunch of noise when you opened them up. And he would sleep in there. But my mother would listen for the chair because she would know he would move and she would go and check on him. So after he had passed away, a few days had passed. And uh, we were all sleeping in the house. My mother had a friend staying over, helping her out. And uh, the chair actually made that noise in the middle of the night. And my mother went into the living room and the Lazy Boy chair was fully opened. Oh, wow. So little things like that were happening in the house. We could hear bells ringing. Uh, uh, you know, pictures would fall off the wall. Little things, little subtle things. But never happened to me, but to other people in, in, the, in the house. So it gave me a really strong interest that maybe there's something else going on. And so I sort of expanded my beliefs in regards to that. Could you tell us a little about what Bytown Paranormal does? We're a, an organization, we're a group of people who are interested in the paranormal. And what we do is we do investigations within the community. Um, we do them both in private residences. We do them in uh, public places, uh, museums, stores, um, and we help people, um, I guess, discover if what's happening to them is possibly paranormal. So uh, some people have questions about things that go on, so we go in there and see if we can offer them some kind of an explanation, whether it's paranormal or not. I'm very eager to ask you some uh, particular details on some of your investigations, but before we get there, maybe more of a philosophical question, is what mindset does your kind of team have as far as the paranormal or ghosts? Uh, are you more skeptical in nature or are you looking more to prove the existence of something supernatural? I, I think the interesting thing about the group is that we all come from different backgrounds. I think overall, uh, there's an interest in the paranormal, but I think that um, we lean towards being uh, skeptical in that we won't uh, jump to a conclusion right away that something could be paranormal. I mean, you know, we, we all believe in it to different extents and we have different reasons or, uh, you know, some of us are more skeptical than others. But I think that we really look at trying to find some kind of evidence before jumping to any conclusion. And only when something is really not explainable uh, through other explanations do we sort of look at it and say, okay, maybe this is something that's a little bit different. So there's almost a, a bit of a, a scientific method you try to try to use in the investigations? Yes, absolutely. We're coming from that perspective. Uh, we're, you know, we're certainly not jumping to conclusions quickly. And uh, so you try to pull away the layers. Is it something within the structure of the house? You know, is it there a noise you picked up outside? Uh, is it possibly possible that you're hearing something else? Uh, we're looking at every other possibility before we actually even say, okay, is is it possible that there's something else here that that may be paranormal? So that's always the starting point. That I assume is to eliminate the more obvious, as you said, kind of, you know, a squeaky chair or, uh, you know, a draft in a room or things like that. That's right. See if you can sort of reproduce what happened by other means. Interesting. And is there any unique or special equipment uh, that you use or have found useful in conducting these investigations? There's all kinds uh, of equipment that you can use on investigations, certainly. Um, and if you watch any kind of paranormal television, you'll see all kinds of 
of gadgets out there. And you can measure everything in an investigation. You can measure breezes. You can measure vibrations. You can measure different kinds of light. You can measure heat, temperature, uh, electromagnetic waves. I mean, anything you can possibly think about that can cause something to move or a noise to be made, there is a piece of equipment for that. Uh, and we use these pieces of equipment. I am not a tech person by far, um, but pretty much anything that you've seen on TV or a lot of the equipment you've seen on TV, we use something uh, like that or exactly like that. But we don't just depend on that. Um, we go in with digital recorders. We go in with cameras, just regular film cameras, uh, digital cameras, video cameras. We record that. And primarily myself, I'm a low-tech investigator. I use my five sen senses. So what am I feeling? What am I hearing? What am I seeing? Um, and then I go to the equipment and see what's going on. So we all do it a little bit differently, but we're not just looking to one thing. We're using all kinds of different tools that are that we have to, I guess, decide what's going on or at least make a, a, guess, a guess as to what could be happening. I have to imagine it can be quite a daunting task, depending how long the investigation goes, if you have a lot of video footage or audio footage. Um, how does that process work? It's kind of, you know, sorting through to see if you have, if you captured anything interesting. There is a lot of evidence to review after every investigation. And um, you would think it's it could be really, really exciting, um, but it's actually really tedious sometimes um, because you're listening to yourself talk and there's a lot of silences and you're hyper listening too. So you have headphones on, you're reviewing, say, a digital recording, not a video recording. So your eyes are closed, you're, you have your hands over your headphone and you're listening for any kind of little noise. And uh, it's not often that you actually get a hit. So you may do a 30 minute recording, you might do three of them in the course of a night, and you have to review 90 minutes of just one digital recorder. Um, but when you get something, it's very exciting, but it's it's getting there that can be a little bit of a slow process. I imagine. And you have to be disciplined when you're listening, because if you're slightly distracted, you got to review and start over again. That's right, you could miss the, uh, the key frames of, uh, of the video or whatever. Very interesting. I definitely want to ask you some particular things you've encountered on your investigations. But I did notice one of the, the most fascinating things I found about Bytown Paranormal, following you guys on Facebook as I do, is your uh, private uh, private homes uh, where people reach out to you to have you come in to perform an investigation. What types of things are people experiencing that they contact you to, to have you come in? I think that the um, your typical haunted house that you see on television or movie is really a rare thing. So I think that when people reach out to us, um, they are experiencing things in the house, but they're not as dramatic as you would see on television or in a movie. But it's enough that it's still making them uncomfortable. And, and certainly that's not all the cases. Some people are fascinated by what's going on in their houses and they just want to know more about it. They're not scared in particular. They just want to educate themselves. They want to see if they can find some kind of evidence so they know that <laughs> they know they're not imagining it. But I guess to give it a little bit of tangibility, I guess. Um, so you know, there's there's that element. And then there's some people that approach us and there, there's an element of fear. Maybe there's a child in the house that's scared. Uh, so they're looking to us for a little bit of an explanation or a reassurance for people in the house who, you know, might be uncomfortable with what's going on. We want to reassure them. We want to give them a little bit of information. Or if we can actually recreate something that's going on in the house that doesn't have any kind of a paranormal nature, then, you know, all the better. I think that leads us nicely into asking you some of the particulars of some of your investigations you've done. But it does make me wonder, how often in these cases are you able to find kind of those nice, simple, uh, calming of nerves kind of explanations to things versus situations where you're, you're not really sure what's happening? It, uh, sometimes we can't find an explanation, but it doesn't mean that something is, is uh, paranormal. But certainly... Um, we were doing uh, one investigation and a, a door opened 
so you look at the door and you say, okay, does it latch properly? No, it doesn't latch properly. Yes, it does. Is there wind outside? And, you know, so you can recreate that very easily. And we have done that in certain situations uh, for a door. Um, you know, if something happens, uh, we were in um, one of the buildings at Lost Villages and um, there's a two-story building and there's a mason room on the top floor and they have a letter G that's hanging from the ceiling um, and it swings once in a while. So it's suspended by a, a double like hook in an eye. And um, so they told us it's, it swings on occasion. And we were in the building and we were setting up. We weren't even doing an investigation. And I looked up and I noticed it was swinging. So nobody had touched it. No one was in the room at the time. We had just walked in. Uh, and we tried to recreate that. So I said, where was everybody? Okay, this person was on the stairs going up and down the stairs. This person was in this room. And we were walking and trying to recreate it. In that case, we weren't able to. Is it paranormal? Well, it's an old house. It's near a highway. Maybe a car made it move. You so, so you sort of look at the environment. But, you know, sometimes you explain things. Sometimes you don't. Um, but again, you don't necessarily jump to the conclusion that it's paranormal. You just can't figure it out yet. We've gone to houses more than once to see if we can actually, because sometimes nothing happens. So we go back to see if we can actually uh, experience some kind of phenomena again. So have you done any investigations, uh, investigations recently that you have found to be quite, quite the stumpers or where you've gathered some evidence that you find really compelling or just difficult to explain? Any favorite cases that have come up recently? There's a couple of things that have happened that are interesting and not necessarily ones I've been on, but ones I've talked to with other members of the group, because we don't always go as a group to the investigations, different variations of, of people in the group will go. Um, one thing that I found w was really interesting, but we didn't have our recording equipment on was, um, again, at Lost Villages, we were in an old log house and we were getting ready to set up. It was around midnight. Nobody else was in the facility. Um, and it's a one room log house, really, really small, couple of hundred years old. And uh, we had all the lights on, no equipment on. And all of a sudden, in the middle of our talking, we heard this really low noise just outside the door. And it just, it was sort of like an ow. It was this long stretched out. And it sounded like a whiny person saying ow. And we just stopped all of a sudden. And we weren't scared. We just bursted out laughing. And then two of the people that were in the house uh, ran outside and went around the building to see if we could find anything. Couldn't find anything. We looked for an animal or something, but it sounded like a voice. And uh, it was so exciting, but we were so frustrated that we didn't have any of the equipment on. So we, we couldn't even re-listen to it again. Um, but when you come across these things, it's, it's, it's so much fun. Um, at the Bytown Museum, we were on the second floor of the Bytown Museum, and we were just sort of talking and asking different questions, and it was pitch dark. And all of a sudden, I heard a woman sigh, and it was just sort of the way you sigh after a long day when you finally get off your feet, that sort of relief. And it was just, <sighs> and there were three of us, and it sounded like I was facing a girl, and it sounded like it was coming from behind her. And I asked her if she heard it, and she said she did, but it sounded like it was coming from behind me. And then the third person who was sort of making a triangle with us didn't hear it at all. And we both heard it, but we weren't able to hear it in any of the recordings, which was disappointing. But it's so exciting when something like that happens that you just, you know, there's not someone else there. It's coming from an area where there's nobody they're making that noise and it makes you wonder what is going on kind of reminds me of a, a movie set or something where there's a lot of sitting or sitting hurry up and wait type thing you know get everything in place uh, start things off and then cross your fingers and hope uh, hope you pick up something absolutely it's like that i think the the thing to compare it with the most is is fishing because you're sitting there you're very quiet you're very patient and you're hypersensitive. So, you know, you've got the, the fishing line in your hand or you've got your eyes closed and you're listening. Um, and you can go for a few hours and nothing can happen. And then when all of a sudden something happens, it's very, very exciting. It, it's the perfect analogy. A few years ago, you'd be hard pressed to turn on the television 
and not come across some type of paranormal investigation, ghost investigation show of all sorts of stripes and, and varieties. In the Haunted Walk, we've been on quite a few of them from uh, ghost hunters to the girly ghost hunters, two very, very different experiences. I'm very curious to know how kind of the boom, and I think we've kind of passed it a bit, and I'd be interested on your thoughts that, on that as well. Now, the, how did that boom affect an organization such as yours? Did it really draw people in at that time? Um, and what, where are we now as far as kind of public interest in, in investigations? I, I think, uh, I guess there's a couple of things to answer in regards to that. I think with all of the, in, the paranormal shows, uh, it made it, I guess, easier to talk about. I think before, maybe in the 90s or in the early 2000s, before it was such a staple of television, um, it was almost embarrassing to talk about your your love of things paranormal or the fact that you might have done an investigation or it's something that you were interested in. So it certainly made it more acceptable to talk about and people were really excited about it. So, you know, that was great for me, um, who may not necessarily talk about it as much. In regards to the group, it might have attracted a couple of people to the group just because they realized, oh, there are people locally who are doing this. But um, I think, and I was one of those people because seeing all the shows got me excited about it. Uh, and when I saw By Town Paranormal, I did send them an email and said, you know what, I would be interested in becoming an investigator. Uh, how do I do that? Um, and the rest is history. Um, but I think the difference about the television shows uh, and what happens, you know, in real in real life is the fact that there's so much evidence that they present on these shows. And it's so unrealistic that they're there for a couple of hours and they have all of these recordings of voices and yeah. images. And, and, you know, that was the most surprising thing to me when I actually went to my first investigation because I thought, oh, we're going to get all kinds of recordings. This is going to be great. You know, I didn't expect you know, to be tapped on the shoulder by anything, but I thought we'd find something and we didn't. And there was so much recording and so much video. Um, and I thought, my goodness, hours and hours of it. And we didn't find anything. And that was the most surprising thing to me. Some of these paranormal shows actually visit the same location for several days in a row for several hours. Um, so, you know, it's really... It's not honest in that they really tell you how long they're there. And I question some of the evidence, you know, I mean, really, how often can you get tapped on the shoulder or your, your shirt can get grabbed? Stuff that's dramatic like that, it, it happens, but it doesn't happen that often. So, you know, that part of it makes you wonder. It's not as exciting. It's not as glamorous, I guess, as TV makes it out. Like I said, when something happens, it's very exciting. But again, do you jump to the conclusion it's paranormal? Or do you sort of say, you know what, let's see if we can get more evidence. Let's see if we can do it again. Um, let's see, let's take a deeper look at it. And I find that it's a bit shallow sometimes on the television shows. In uh, Bytown Paranormal's investigations, has there ever been a moment or a piece of evidence where it has felt like you were on a TV show where something... Uh, so unexpected has happened? I don't think anything unexpected has happened. Um, because again, you're hypersensitive that something is going to happen. There's always that expectation, even when it doesn't happen in the back of your mind, it's there. But I think, um, I, and I didn't go, this was before my time, but uh, the group visited the Cornwall jail and they got some great EVPs there, um, just asking questions. So and that's you know, electronic well, sorry, voice yeah. phenomena. Is that yeah, yeah, voice recordings, voice recordings. Okay. So you know, asking questions and getting answers that are are pertinent to what the questions are being asked, or um, in a lot of the answers, I can't really repeat. There was swearing involved, which was oh. really neat because it was a jail as well. Um, but you know, they got some some strong. Uh, voice recordings there and and that was kind of uh, exciting for them uh, so so little things like that I wish I could say you know we have this great film of an apparition coming down a staircase or uh, you know a picture that we can't explain 
But, um, you know, it's, it's not as exciting than that. There's high points, certainly, when you get vocal or you get a picture that's kind of a little off. Um, but a lot of the time, it's just, it's not as glamorous as TV. And that's one of the things that um, when you try to explain to people or you're demonstrating your evidence to them, I think they're expecting like such a huge reveal. And it's often not like that. We're hoping, and you, you know, you always have that expectation of catching the big fish, um, but it's 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 like a big fish. It's very very rare, but you, you but you hope. Is there a certain location that the team has investigated where you perhaps think it is haunted? It defies reasonable explanation. I would think the Cornwall Jail was certainly that kind of experience, and we haven't gone back. Uh, we'd love to get back in there. Uh, and see what we could actually get. I think that was a really exciting investigation, and we still talk about it. Um, and a lot of the the places you go, you kind of get a feeling. So it it just depends. It you know it's hard to say. I think I think a lot of buildings have the potential to be haunted. You know, especially in a city that's so historic like Ottawa, there's so many old buildings. There's so many people that have gone through them. There's so many history, historic things that happened here. I'm not saying every house that you've gone, you know, we've gone to is haunted. But we're a huge country. We have, you know, burial grounds and farmer's fields that have been forgotten. We have you know, Aboriginal people who you know, have lived here and moved on and passed away and generations and generations. There's so much great stuff that's happened. You know, why not paranormal? You folks are up to something really cool, I think, this summer. And you did it last summer, I believe, as well. And that's public investigations. Could you tell us a little bit about what you folks are up to this summer and what people will have the chance to experience? Uh, last year was our first year working with Lost Villages, and we did we did some. And where is Lost Villages? Lost Villages is actually in Long Sioux, Ontario, so uh, just outside of Cornwall, okay. on Highway Number Two. And what it is is it's a small historic village that actually has houses that were moved from the villages that were lost and flooded when the seaway was built. So it's a huge historical, well, it's not huge, but it's, there's several buildings. It's huge compared to uh, what it was. Um, and it has different buildings. It has a church. It has a schoolhouse. It has the old log cabin I was talking about. Um, and it just sort of gives a perspective of what life would have been like um, before the flooding happened. And it saves some of the, the things that were actually lost because when the villages were flooded, they're on, they were underwater. Some people moved their things. Some people weren't able to move their things. So it was sort of, it's sort of a living record of what happened. And uh, it's, it's really interesting, uh, some of the things that they have there. So they have these buildings that have been donated uh, by different families. And um, we, go, we get to go into these buildings and uh, do investigations, and it's very exciting. So will the public have the chance then to, do you kind of lead them, lead them through, through the process? Do, uh, do they get equipment and kind of get to wander around on their own? What would kind of the experience be like on the night of? Well, last year what we were doing is we were just sort of giving a perspective of what we do as a paranormal group. So we would show them uh, some of the equipment that we would use. That wasn't me that was doing that demonstration. Um, but we would show the different equipment that the team uses in different situations. Um, and then what we would do is we might take them into a building with a smaller group and we would uh, do a recorded session. So where we would ask questions um, and we would give them the opportunity to ask questions. But I think a lot of people were shy. They wanted to observe more. Um, and then we, we would move to another building and we might talk about, you know, different things that happened in the building. If they had questions, we'd answer the questions. So we tried to give them a little taste of what was going on, but it was more of a demonstration than actually uh, an experience that was inclusive. This year, what we're trying to do is actually to give the, op the, the people opportunity to use the equipment or to bring their own equipment um, again, to educate them on how to use it, but to have more of a hands-on experience. So using the equipment more, seeing how it works, how we would use it in an investigation situation, and uh, 
maybe spending a little more time in the buildings because there's so many buildings there and there were so many people interested. Some people just wanted more time in the building to do something tangible, to do an investigation. So we're going to give them more of that opportunity this year. That sounds fantastic. And are there dates already set uh, for these investigations? Yes, there's three dates. So our first one is going to be on June 22nd, or sorry, June 27th. The second is July 25th. And the third and last one will be on August 22nd. Excellent. And if folks are interested in, in attending, how do they go about getting tickets? They have to contact the Lost Villages. So if you go to their website, the lostvillages.ca, they will be able to answer your questions and get you tickets. Uh, Bytown Paranormal also has a Facebook page. So if you want to follow us on Facebook, we put all kinds of information there as well. Um, and there's usually links. So you can follow the link and get information for tickets for any of the public events. We highly recommend following uh, Bytown Paranormal on Facebook. Lots of really excellent content. To wrap up, Sue, I'll kind of give you uh, uh, the big question to end with. And that's if you could have... You could pick any spot in the world as your dream investigation location. Where are you going? Where are you going to investigate? Well, I think that anybody who knows me at all knows I'm going to pick England. And I would probably say the Tower of London. I would love to do an investigation there. That's an excellent choice. Thanks so much for joining us today, Sue. Reminder, the website is bytownparanormal.ca. And definitely check them out on Facebook as well. And thank you for listening to today's episode. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes. If you leave us a review there, we might even mention it in the next episode. Information on The Haunted Walk can always be found at our website, hauntedwalk.com. Also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until we meet again, sweet dreams. <laughs>